about plugin development today. Um, Mike Shingle, I'm gonna start with you because I've known you the longest. Um, I would say you're like one of the kind of early patriarchs of the WordPress community here in Atlanta. He definitely kind of kicked some stuff off here in Atlanta that in a lot of ways kind of started us to where we are here today with this WordCamp and all these awesome <coughs> meetups. Um, Mike runs uh, the Coder Skills, which is a cool thing you started um, getting people interested in actually like WordPress more plugin development, less necessarily user uh, meetup stuff. Um, Naomi, you run the uh, <coughs> Geek, or the Gwinnett meetup space, is that right as well? Sorry, I also participate in a place called Geek Space Gwinnett, which is a maker space in Gwinnett, and so it's all the G's are a little confusing. Um, Naomi, you're a mother of two, is that right? Just one. Just one. Just one. Just okay, one. she's not that crazy. Um, <laughs> not that crazy. Um, and you actually uh, have presented here at a couple of Atlanta work camps yeah. um, and uh, have gone around in some other regional work camps and, and talked. Um, and I met Naomi when you're starting your uh, the Gwinnett meetup, and so it's cool to kind of watch um, what Naomi's been able to uh, accomplish uh, over there. And then. Uh, Patrick, I know nothing about. Um, he's from Denver, so I'm just right. Is that right? That's right. I'm going yeah. off <laughs> just like starter <laughs> profile stuff. It says he's a yoga monkey, um, so maybe there can be an opportunity for some demo of what that means. <laughs> after that yeah. with that. Uh, after <laughs> right. Um, and uh, also uh, product manager at WooCommerce. Is that right. right. So that's an e-commerce thing in here. Right. Okay. WordPress e-commerce platform. Very cool. All right. So um, guys, if you guys have any questions uh, of the panelists, um, I, I'm gonna try to get some of my stuff into the, into the end, um, and then um, we'll turn it over to y'all's questions as well. Sorry for crossing the front of you, I gotta get back to my notes. Um, so I guess the first thing, um, question I have for you, Patrick, um, another thing mentioned on your Twitter profile <coughs> is that you also make sound effects. Um, so is that something like you do, like, audibly, verbally, is that something you could demonstrate just quickly to kick us off? Uh, I could try. You know the water drop thing where you like... Wow. So I like sound effects. Uh, you probably can't hear them in the back. I'm sorry. I'm not... I don't know how to project that. But, uh, <laughs> I do like sound effects. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, just to kind, of, to kind of quickly get things off, um, I, I had this idea for kind of a, just a couple rapid fire questions. So. Uh, to each of you, um, let's just kind of go, uh, we'll start at the end with Mike and just kind of, let's go as fast as we can for a minute. Don't repeat yourself or anybody else and uh, try to keep it as short as possible. So a couple words at the most. Uh, if, what, what, what tool could you absolutely not do your job without? One word, PHP Storm. Next. Debugger. Debugger. Thank you. GitHub. What? GitHub. No. Mike, back to you. <coughs> We're going for 60 seconds. Slack. Slack. Okay, thank you. Big <laughs> bucky. Okay. Uh, Beanstalk for deploying things. Thank you. Thank you. Virtual box. <laughs> uh, Adam, which is a code editor. Uh -huh. Composer. Yeah, there you go. Text editing. <laughs> One more. Close this off. Um, let's go with Travis CI. Okay. Um, so, uh, next question, I guess, is, um, I'm going to start with Naomi. So, um, just to kind of give them a little context of some of your, I think, most notable plugin uh, development is the Stripe Gravity Forms right. plugin. Would you say that's probably your, one of your uh, most adopted plugins? Um, if you could just kind of talk about uh, briefly kind of some of the, uh, not so much why you created the plugin, um, but kind of where you're at with it now. Um, okay. What maybe... Um, are some of your, your your challenges, and specifically through the context of uh, developing extensions for existing premium plugins. Could you just kind of speak on that? Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So Gravity Forms plus Stripe, uh, that is uh, the main product that I work on now. And 
really it started because I was doing client work and um, it was for a nonprofit and they had um, they had a lot of members who were not maybe so uh, technically capable all right and so the PayPal flow for taking those memberships was really painful all right because it's like okay how do I know that they're making it through that they're making it to this other website and then they're making it back and that everything is doing uh, what it's supposed to do so I had heard of stripe and I'm like okay that looks cool and then I had finally found the perfect use for it all right because as you know stripe it does not send people away from your site all right it keeps people right on your site so I needed it for gravity forms because that's what we were using so I asked the gravity forms guys to make it and they were like well you know we're not going to get to it right now and um, so I'm like well I need it right now so you know up until that point I had resisted going back into programming um, I have a computer engineering degree and so as part of that you know coursework we had to you know, know how to program I had resisted it and I said well I'm gonna have to dust this off. So I took another, uh, took another extension and kind of reverse engineered it um, to use Stripe. Um, it was using authorized.net, so I reverse engineered it to use Stripe. And I said, well, hey, um, you know, I, I wanted to contribute more to WordPress, but I said, well, hey, maybe uh, this will be useful for somebody. And so I just made it available, put it on the WordPress repository. And about 24 hours later, someone had sent me a $50 donation and was on the Gravity Forms forum saying, please, uh, you guys, we really need this, donate, um, and let's help keep this plugin going. So three years later, people are still donating their $50, and the plugin is still going. Um, of course, it's gone through a complete rewrite. Um, and really what I did was I resisted it for a while, but I listened to what the customers were asking for. All right, so it's actually turned into something different than just a regular um, Gravity Forms payment add-on as you, as you know it. So I would say that was definitely one of the challenges. Uh, there was a customer that they kept pushing and kept pushing and kept pushing with money, all right, and said, so, please, we want these features, all right? And so I said, okay, you know, I finally gave in and went ahead and built it, and I would say that has those few features have probably kept the plugin going and propelled it for the amount of time that it's been going, um, you know, because it was what people really wanted. So I would say that's one thing <coughs> you need to listen to the customer. And, um, you know, once I saw that, I said, hmm, this is good. So I, you know, I started asking customers, hey, can we just 15 minutes, you know, five minutes, you know, please, I just want to, I want to talk to you. I want to hear from you. Um, so another thing is, um, I would say another challenge is the WordPress repository. <laughs> All right, I hate to say that. It, you know, it was not supposed to be, you know, a paid plugin. It was just something I built, and you know, I put it out there. Um, and so being on the WordPress repository is both a blessing, um, but also you don't get to know who your customer is, and so it's like flying blind because I have no idea who these people are and you know of course it's against the rules to you know try to find you know try to contact them through information that's available <coughs> on their site and so it. it's a curse too <laughs> please, it's, please it's, I can't tweet it unless you say it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a challenge it's both a blessing and a challenge as, as with you know most things in life so um, so yeah, that, that, has, that has been interesting. And of course, the review system for any plugin author, that is definitely, uh, definitely a challenge, all right? Um, because, you know, that's kind of, I guess what you live and die by. You know, people come to see your plugin and they see bad reviews and, you know, you don't quite, you know, get the, the voice that you would like to. Um, but again, it is, it is a blessing, but it is a challenge. So that's just something to, to be mindful of. Um, was there anything no, else? No, no, oh, and so you said the. Well, so what is it um, about building, building something that is built on top of another platform? And of course, people will tell you, you know, never do that. But I mean, when you look at it, um, we're all doing it in some way. You know, Stripe. You're using you're using Stripe for payments. If Stripe goes down, then what? Even if you're using PayPal, 
If something happens with PayPal, then what? We're all using these kind of third-party systems and putting them together. I was reading an article the other day um, talking about how um, you know Uber is kind of uh, <laughs> it's a trans transportation company without uh, without any vehicles. All right. And really, they're a software company because all they're doing is taking these APIs and they're kind of mashing them together. All right, and creating a service for all of us to use. So, um, so it is a challenge, and I would I would say for anybody who is thinking about doing it, choose the right platform. I lucked out. Okay, I really I really did. I just happened, you know, Gravity Forms was popular, so I use Gravity Forms and. Um, it just happened to be that it's a great platform for doing that sort of thing. All right, there are a lot of users, there are a lot of people that are hungry, um, you know, for extending it in in many different ways. And you know, the people are they're generally a um, you know a really good customer. Okay, you're not you're not going to find too many um, you know too many bad apples. Okay, now. Of course, you'll you'll always have some. I'm not going to say there aren't any, but I have I have been blessed. So I would say choose the right platform uh, if you're going to build an extension on top of someone else's. Another thing is make sure that they are friendly, all right, to third-party developers because some platforms don't want you to. <coughs> Look at Twitter, all right. Look at what they did with their with their API. I think LinkedIn just got rid of their API, all right. So make sure that they're friendly and that they want you building on top of. Uh, you know, on top of what, what they have. And also make sure that they don't mind you making a profit off of it, okay? Because that's another thing. They may say, well, I don't want you selling an add-on for, you know, my thing. Maybe they want to do it all themselves, all right? So just make sure that, um, you know, that they are friendly to, to um, you know, to you building on, on top of their platform because it's just not worth it. You know, life is too short to try to fight with somebody or something like that. So, thank you. Um, so, Patrick, kind of a, a follow-up question um, to, to that, as uh, from the other perspective, as with your work with WooCommerce, you guys obviously also utilize a number of kind of third-party developer-driven um, extensions. Mm -hmm. And I know that I've noticed that you also uh, have uh, Ninja Forms on your plugin repository profile, um, and and I think they kind of similarly have a, a kind of an extension model. Um, and if you could just kind of talk about it from, as specifically from the WooCommerce perspective of kind of encouraging people and, and maybe on Naomi's note about do you uh, do you encourage people to, to build onto your platform and to extend it and to profit from it and all of that and just kind of talk from your perspective what does that look like? Yeah, good question. I, uh, so WooCommerce is a platform, it's a very extendable WordPress um, plugin. It's just over three years old and when we got started it was it was the right plugin at the right time, and we really encouraged people to build extensions. And in three years, we've gone from having zero sites to having 400,000. And I think that's mostly because everything's open, anyone could do anything. If there wasn't a Stripe plugin, you could build it. If there wasn't an authorized.net plugin, you could build it. I think allowing your plugin to be extendable, to build a platform that other people can build on, is the fastest way to grow. And now that we're three years, it's a little bit different. We won't, like, in, I feel like year one was the Wild West. We're like, what, you wanna build a plugin? Build it, go, we'll sell it. And, uh, and now we're much more conservative. We spend a lot more time auditing code. And a lot of people that don't know how to use GitHub, we're like, we'd love to work with you, but this is a requirement. Um, so yeah, we use extensions now, our own site. We won't, if you guys wanna release your own plugins for free on wordpress.org, that's great, but stuff on our site goes through a pretty thorough review process. We still do work with some third parties. We probably do about half of the extensions in-house. Okay. Um, and so kind of switching gears a little bit, Mike, I know that most of your work is kind of more on the, uh, I would say more enterprise uh, at this point yes. level, our, our type of plugin. It's a little bit different mindset of, I'm gonna try to, to release a, a product that's being you know really targeted and sold to the end consumer. Mm -hmm versus kind of working in some of these other systems. Um, I'm particularly interested if you can just kind of talk about some of your experience um, kind of on that side um, and, and maybe you know tell us a little bit about something that is, is kind of off the beaten path in terms of uh, you know what you would normally think of a, a plugin to do. So, um, <coughs> first chance I had to cough. Um, the, um, 
what I'd like to do also when I'm doing that is ask for a show of hands to get a kind of an idea of what people are interested in, in sure. here. So um, let me let me go down the path and say there's a when you say plug-in development, there's probably four or five different kind of things that you might mean in terms of plug-in development. Uh, we'll start with uh, WooCommerce. Um, you might want to build a product that you would then sell. Um, you might want to uh, build a plug-in that you then uh, do what Naomi did initially, which is give it away, um, which she then evolved into uh, a, a paying version of that plug-in. Um, you might build a custom plugin because a client comes along and says, I need a store locator. So you go build a store locator for them. Um, and then what we have evolved into doing is building uh, what, I don't know how many, how many of you are familiar with MU plugins? Must use plugins? So we use MU plugins as essentially the base for our site, or for a, for a site that we build for a client, and, uh, and, then a, and then pair that with a theme custom theme. So of, of those different things, who here, who is here to want to learn about how to build a product? Okay, just a couple. Uh, who's here to want to learn about how to build plugins uh, to distribute to the WordPress repository for open source purposes? A few more. Um, one guy keeps raising his hand. Um, and then who wants to just learn about Plug-in development so they can build custom solutions for their clients. So about a fifth, two fifths, and two fifths, right? Um, <coughs> I don't know what else to say on that. that point. Well, I mean, on that note, I think they, they all do have some kind of commonalities. There's some there's some structural things that really all good plugins kind of need, um, and so. You know, if you want to focus on a, a, one of those specific kind of avenues, then that's fine. But but in general terms, kind of what are those core functionality, those core things that are well, really probably everybody knows this, but just in case you don't, um, if you modify core, you shouldn't be programming. So the whole uh, the whole point of WordPress architecture is, to, uh, at least from an extensibility standpoint, is to empower as much extensibility with with zero modification of, of core. And anybody who's been programming in open source for a while probably already knows that, but if you're new to the concept, um, it's really, really, really a bad idea to say, oh, well, it's only one line of code that I have to change here in core. <laughs> and uh, you do that, you deploy it, and then WordPress auto-upgrades to the next version, <laughs> now you're, now you're kind of screwed. So I probably need a little bit more <coughs> specific direction to, to, to know where to head. Sure. So well, let me let me kind of change gears and then on that because I, I I wanted to go somewhere but I don't think we're gonna get there. Um, so so in regards to um, specifically kind of APIs and, and following the WordPress way, um, if you could just kind of maybe tell us one what is uh, kind of your your favorite if you will of you know uh, if you had to pick just a single API to spend a lot of time with, which one would probably annoy you the least? Um, and uh, and at the same time like what what has that specific API kind of enabled you to now do in uh, in your in your development? If you need to take a minute to well, let me let me pull up two. Sure. One um, probably most people know, but uh, WP Query because mm -hmm. you can do far. I mean that's that's the crux of, of WordPress is being able to pull data out of the database. So working really if you so along the lines of what would you spend time spending a lot of time learning? Um, it's learning WP Query. Learning how to um, actually learning how to build SQL. So one of the things that I end up doing when I'm using WP Query is I'll pass in the, the arguments, and then at the very end, after it's re after it's returned the object, I'll go to the request property, grab the SQL, pop it into my SQL editor, make sure it runs and, and returns the data that I was looking for. And if it doesn't, then I'll tweak the SQL until I figure out what I wanted, and then I'll figure out how to translate it back to WP Query. Um, I use a tool, I'm on a Mac, I use a tool called Navicat. They also have it on uh, Windows and on um, Linux. It's, um, it's, there are tools that you can download and, and, and pay for, um, but if, you do, if you're doing anything professional, don't get the mindset of, well, I have to use everything that's free and open source. It's like if you're billing $50 an hour, buy a $50 tool that's going to make you that much more productive. So that's the, the one thing that I'd say is learn to spend a lot of time. 
the one that I, the, the one hook that I really, um, I pushed for and actually got, um, much to the chagrin of a few people on the core team, uh, was, uh, and now I can't remember, do parse request. So I, so WordPress has URLs that are context free. <coughs> Meaning that you can look at the URL and know exactly what it's going to do if you understand what the rewrite properties have been set to, right? But a lot of times you want a, a website where um, you don't have the, for example, the post type slug in the in front of it. So I'll give you an example of a project that we're work, that we're wrapping up right now. We're doing a, a site for internal site for Coca Cola for brand standards. So you know for each of their brands. I didn't want URLs that said, you know, this site, this site slash brands slash Coca Cola. I just wanted it to say this site slash Coca Cola, right? So the do parse request actually allows you to go in there and fiddle with it. And last WordCamp, I gave a talk on advanced URL routing, and uh, and it's actually it's called hardcore URL routing. So if anybody's really interested in in that topic, you can Google that from last year's WordCamp and figure out how to do it. Any of you, any like kind of favorite APIs you want to add to that? Yeah. Yes. Um, so the plugin API, obviously. Um, hooks are wonderful. Um, since I consume, consume a lot of APIs in my work, uh, the HTTP API is really great. Um, it prevents you from having to know whether the underlying system has curl on it or not. Um, so it handles all of that beautifully if you need to interact with any outside system. And then um, a recent favorite of mine is the, um, the WP uh, database API. And that's, um, that's really cool because I don't know if you know it or not, but you can actually uh, use that class to, um, to connect to other databases other than the WordPress database. So it's, um, it's pretty cool. Uh, let me start with the least favorite is the settings API. Okay. <laughs> uh, just, my people. Um, uh, so if, if you ever build something to be extended by someone else, write something on top of the settings API. Like if you want to add a WooCommerce setting, it's easier than adding a WordPress setting. And it goes in the right place. And, um, but I think for favorites API, I'm, I'm in love with the customizer right now, and I'm trying to move everything I can from like weird checkboxes and settings pages into the customizer where they can see it. So if you want to have your shop page mm -hmm. as the home page, like your WooCommerce shop page on the home page, you should just do that in the customizer and all of a sudden see all of your products on the shop page, mm -hmm. as opposed to having abstract checkboxes in the back end. So it's a little bit tricky to do, but you can do some cool stuff with plugins in the customizer. All right, so switching gears, um, in terms of testing, um, one of the things that you know, there's, I think, a lack of in the WordPress community is really good, solid test-driven development. Um, but it's, it's kind of challenging when, you know, I know for myself, and, and you probably speak for a lot of other people, can you just talk a little bit about, um, about your kind of, if you do testing, test-driven development, and if so, kind of what are some of the, the challenges so far that you've had with that, and, and how do you kind of manage that? Let me just start? Yeah. So my biggest challenge with test-driven development is getting clients to put the budget toward it. Um, so consequently, we've done far less test-driven development than we would like to, because the the projects that we tend to work on are uh, our so what our focus is is we we don't actually build sites for clients. We build sites for agencies who then deliver them to clients, um, and so. When we get a project, it's at the 11th hour. It's got to be done now <coughs> because the agency waits to get to get bring us in until pretty late in the, the process. So um, I don't uh, really have a whole lot to talk about technically. I'll let others talk about the technical. But getting the client to appreciate the value of it is hard. Anybody else something to add on that? I would say uh, going back and now. Um, now trying to add test cases to old plugins, especially old plugins that are um, are kind of large. Uh, that's probably that's probably the one thing that has been the biggest challenge for me, um, especially when um, you know when you're still learning proper WordPress 
uh, development practices or just proper practices, period. All right, you know, don't have a function that's a thousand lines long. <laughs> you know, don't. <laughs> or two thousand, like W squared. <laughs> You know, things like that, you know, they don't lend well to, um, you know, to writing good tests. So now, as he said, finding the time to go back and now refactor uh, this old code to be able to, uh, you know, to be properly tested. So we use, sorry, you're done? So we use, uh, we have unit tests for WooCommerce, um, and we have Travis CI on our GitHub, and... I think that's all we have for automated testing. We're only at about 22% unit tests coverage, which isn't great. Uh, boy, WooCommerce is massive, and so we're rewriting a lot of stuff to be able to use to, to, to be able to use unit tests. It's worth it, um, but I wouldn't honestly. If I'm starting a brand new premium plugin, I wouldn't do unit tests unless you know you're going to have a ton of people using it. It's just it's a lot of work. Um, I, I just wouldn't start. Like, prove, I mean, I'm, I, I like this. Is, this is my pants are good. Um, I think you need. I'm very lean. So as soon as a hundred people buy the plugin, as soon as you know people are going to keep using it and buying it, then do unit tests. I wouldn't. I wouldn't do it day one. So there's definitely an argument for unit yeah. tests. Yeah. It's called test-driven development, where mm -hmm. you, you, d you define yeah. your requirements yeah. in your test. So um, I would. Uh, I would I'm sorry, I, 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 I've absolutely got to take objection to that. I mean, <laughs> this is no, the, 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 I, I've got projects that never see the light of day. They're mm -hmm. only used on my own server at home, and they're 75%. I mean, I'm not a 100% unit test guy, but to as an expert, to yeah. tell people that are getting into development, don't do unit testing. That's saying it's okay to accept technical debt. You'll pay the interest until you can bother to pay it off at some other time. That you know, we, the PHP community has spent five, six years teaching developers as they're coming up to start with unit testing because when you do that, you have a lot less technical debt. Now, now I understand your argument. I face that one. And there's no good answer oh, to that. It's, I'm not arguing against the unit test. <laughs> no, no, I, mean, I understand the, yeah. I've been in your situation, and yes, sometimes you just can't get clients to pay for it. But on any given project, if uh, especially if it's a, it's a Greenfield project, yeah, you, I, I don't usually start with, I'm not test-driven development, but I always have unit tests on 50 to 75% of it, just so that when I go to screw something up later on, mm -hmm. hey, this setting needs to change. I know everything else is still going to work. I want to interject something here, and that is that for those of you who don't know who's talking here, it's Cal Evans. He's a luminary in the PHP community. Um, so <laughs> I'm not pointing you out to, to embarrass you. I'm pointing it out to he's an authority in the in, in the space. So, well, thank you. Obviously, there's some you know some some gray area mm -hmm. here. So we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, so talk to me a you little got a, bit you about got a question in the in the back. Uh, a question in the back. Yes, sir, I just had a comment and a question too. Uh, comment, the uh, only thing I'm doing right now to give back to the WP community is to review plugins that work and don't work. I would encourage everybody else to please do that because that really helps people who are reviewing, oh, this one might work, this one sucks, you know, that really helps. Um, the question I had is, is somebody new to or that's going to start trying to do plugin development, what is a good hello world plugin, like what files would you need to change? What's the general process for creating a simple hello world plugin just to get used to it? Well, I, I, I think I, I'd like to maybe take that question a little further. So he said, what's a good hello world? So I'm gonna kind of direct this quickly to Naomi. Um, I know you've taught uh, before at the high school level, was that right, or college level? Um, and you taught web development there, is that correct? No. no? Uh, Program so introduction to Java. Okay, so 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 in in if you were to think about kind of the that hell that day one you know exercise, what do you what would you take a a new plugin developer, someone who's never written a plugin in their life, they're green, they probably could tell you that hooks and filters you know exist in a tackle box somewhere. Sure. Um, what what would be your first project for them? Okay. Yeah. So I would say before you write a line of code, read code. Mm -hmm. um, Read good code, all right. That's that would that would be the first first project that I would do. Would be to 
read would be read to read. Some good code. So maybe uh, would that be like how do you encourage people to read code? Would you just say here's here's a plugin like go go read this plugin, um, <laughs> or would you give them maybe a here's a plugin that's got a problem? Go find the bug. Like what kind of assignment would you give to, to someone? Sure. So I mean, GitHub is awesome, but you know I would have a plugin in mind, um, just a simple plugin. Um, there, are, I'm trying to think of one, um, a very simple one. There's a user switching plugin mm. by um, his name escapes me, but um, you know he's a well-known guy in the WordPress community. So a simple plugin, uh, one file, you know maybe a couple of different files. Start there. Mm -hmm. All right. Look at the structure. Uh, you know look at what he's doing. All right, and then kind of ramp up to maybe something like uh, like easy digital downloads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, which is huge. Um, but the reason why I love easy digital downloads is um, I've learned so much by reading uh, by reading Pippin's code uh, mm. here lately, just looking at how he structures things. I wouldn't necessarily do it the same way, but you kind of when you look at different people's coding style, coding styles, you look at how they've solved different problems. It helps you then when you sit down to write your own code. And so for me. I mean, everybody's learning style is different, but then for me, I would take a project that I want to do, something that I need, something that I want, and then I would I would start. So it wouldn't be, I guess, some hello world. It would be something that's useful, but that's yeah. just because of, of my personality. Uh, before I started writing plugins, I was hacking plugins. So I would use a plugin on a site, and I would need to change just a bit of functionality, and so I would hack it to do what I needed it to do, and so that's how I started uh, getting in, you know, saying, okay, I'm just going to develop my own plugin. Jack Blackburn, by the way. Thank you. So, Patrick, John Blackburn. Um, oh, sorry, John. Yes. Well, you know, we're kind of talking about, like, moving into starting these plugins and, and creating my first plugin and all this. So if you were to talk just briefly about like the planning process, what do you what do you do before you ever go to write a single line of code? Like, what is your process for uh, you know figuring out what your roadmap is before you ever go into that? Could you just speak about that a bit? Yeah. So let, let me just start with um, I, I write a lot on my blog, and just as an example, all the posts that I think are going to be really popular, no one ever reads, and all the posts that I think are throwaway posts become my most popular posts on my blog. So we have. As a creator of blog content and plugins, but as a creator of blog content, I have no idea what is going to be popular. And so before you invest a ton of time into building a plugin, always release a beta of version one, make it light, make it simple, make it fast, and just do 60, 80 percent of what you think what you like before building a massive e-commerce solution, just have a buy button and a cart and, or not even a cart, just a buy button. Um, once you're at, it's nice, we're at scale now in WooTeams. We have an ideas board, and so we have 2,000 ideas for WooCommerce. Can you please do this, do this, do this? Lots of them have two or three votes. A couple of them have 600 votes. Once you get to that scale, it's really easy when you see 600 votes to build that product. Before you get there, um, for unrelated projects, I've just put stuff up on my blog and say, hey, it'd be really great if WordPress did this. If you wanted it to do that, please email me. And after 15 emails, I built it. Um, I think you need to you need to get you need to hear from users that they want it, and before you spend a lot of time building something, you need to validate that that's a good idea. So, here, yeah, we're we're very lean with teams. We want to make sure that idea is valid before investing a lot of dev resources in it. Okay. Is there anything to add? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm I'm gonna kind of think I go closer to the to the question that he asked that I think he asked, which is. Uh, more like a, from a technical perspective, how do you go and build the, the plugin? Right. Um, and uh, so let's say that it's not a product. So I, we, this is great because we've got different perspectives. Um, from a, a product person is thinking, well, should we build it or not? And uh, somebody who's building it for a client isn't thinking, should we build it or not? Because the client says build it, right? <laughs> um, so from that perspective, I don't have a good um, like way to point you to it, and I'm not sure I would recommend reading other code until you actually get into working with other plugins, or building plugins, because I'm not sure you're going to understand what you're reading until you actually bump into those problems. Um, 
I tried to write a blog called Hardcore WP for a while, and all the posts are still up there, and I was trying to build up from the beginning, and I found that as a blogger, I'm the type of person that goes super in-depth into something, and I just never, I just couldn't find the time to continue that. Um, there are some things up there that um, they might have, um, my thinking on it might have evolved since then, but it's, there's some posts up there about how to structure a, a plugin, but I'm not so much wanting to point you to that, because I really don't care if there's traffic up there or not. Um, but um, more to say that there, there is a, a very small amount of here's how to build a plugin, and then a very large amount of what are you doing with that plugin, because what you're doing with that plugin is going to determine which hooks you use, and that's going to take you down a path. This direction is vastly and wildly different from this direction. So um, as far as what it looks like, I've come to believe that um, that you really need to use classes uh, to wrap your your plugin in, and your add action and add filters should be done inside of a method. Uh, we call it on load. Um, a lot of people will either say, "I don't understand object orientation, so I won't do that," or the or other people will write, "How to write an object oriented pl plugin?" And I'm going to challenge that both of those are wrong. Um, Really, all we're talking about doing is using a class to uh, wrap the code so that you don't have to uh, namespace your function names. You, you, you take the class and, and you know, fortunately he's, he's bobbing his head up and down and not back and forth here, Cal. Um, but in WordPress, we're still in, in pre-5.3, so namespacing is not really the way that you go about in WordPress. So um, WordPress would bastardize the name namespacing to mean prefixing with a common name. Right. So if you're, if you're doing a plugin, it's much, much easier. In my, I'm, I'm always looking for repeatable code patterns, ones I don't have to think about, so that every time I do it, I, I, can, I can write the same code, um, the same boilerplate code, a year and a half later, look back, and it's exactly the same, because I found the pattern that works, right? And so the pattern that I found that works is a class that wraps everything, um, a static method called onload at the top. Um, your your hooks are placed inside of there, and of course they go to static methods in the uh, in in the class. Um, and uh, let's see what else is there. Um, and there, therefore you oh uh, and we as much as possible if there's if it's an init hook, the name of the method is underscore init. Underscore implies that it's not to be used on the outside, it's just for the hook. Um, you can't make it you can't make it protected because then it can't be called by the, the eventing system. Really wish that PHP would have its own built-in eventing system. Um, and uh, but if if you take that and then of course the header for PHP, excuse me, the header for plugins, which is the commenting system that, that you learn, which is minimally a comment that has plugin name colon. At the top, um, that's that's your starter plugin. And uh, if anybody's kind of curious, it's like, well, I didn't really follow that verbally. I'd like to see it visually. Uh, you can come up afterwards, or um, this is a bit of a sales pitch. If you're in Atlanta, we have a group called Atlanta WordPress Coders Guild. It's on Meetup, and our whole point is to do workshops to to bring the the, the level of coding skill. Uh, in Atlanta up so that more companies would say, yeah, let's use WordPress instead of Sitecore or some of the enterprise solutions, uh, Adobe CQ and, or, or, or SharePoint or whatever. So that, that's kind of our motivation for, for that. But yeah, so, so learn, the, learn, learn, learn the boilerplate and then, then it's the Wild West because now you've got to figure out what the hooks do. Would the boilerplate code go in functions.php? Good question. Good question. If you generally, um, I have two answers for that. First answer, well, the easy answer is no. <laughs> the first answer is um, depends upon what it's used for. If it's a if if it's what we are my company is generally building now, we're building plugins that are overall overarching wrappers for the site. The the site won't behave won't work without them, right? So in that case, they would go into the MU plugins directory. Um, if it's a if it's a feature add-on like like a WooCommerce, even though you know 
if you're using WooCommerce, you pretty much your site better have it, right? Um, but if it's a feature add-on plugin um, that you would activate and deactivate, like maybe Backup Buddy, then then that would go into the plugins directory. And one thing about the MU plugins directory, they are not automatically loaded unless they're in the root. So we always have to create one file called plugin loader, and then we just have a require statement for each of the uh, the, 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 the main file of the plugin in the subdirectory. Is that the WordPress plugin boilerplate you're referring to? That's not at all. Part of the use of the care? Uh, no. That's, no. To me, that's, that's different. Well, over architected. Okay. I agree. So I'm going I'm to pause us on, on that really quick. We've just got a few more minutes, and I've only got one more real kind of burning question for these guys. But I just want to see if there's maybe any other kind of quick questions we can take from the audience before we go. Yes, right there. Yeah, um, I want to go back to that testing debate. Um, just because uh, fun. Um, so I understand making uh, making sure that the product works, but isn't it better to actually put it out there and have people test it and use it and get feedback and improve it as opposed to letting it sit on your computer and never see the light of day? I mean, I think if I took that route, then I would never publish a plugin because I'd be too afraid of. The argument for test driven development is that you start with the tests, you start writing the tests, and then your development for the, uh, the actual code goes much faster because you immediately know when it's not working uh, and you immediately, and at the, before you start writing it, you know what the interface for it's gonna be. <clears throat> so I would say that your, your not, not on purpose, but your, your argument would be a straw man, uh, which would, it, it's not, the, um, if you, the, the, the biggest difficulty with test driven development is getting tests up and running so that you're comfortable doing it. Once you're comfortable doing it, it's faster. I just wanted to add that like, it might be really easy to think about it this way is that normally whenever you develop anything, you have a set of requirements and you're defining that set of requirements. Test-driven development allows you to require or set those requirements and also think what, what, what is, how exactly is this going to work, um, not just uh, this is what it needs to do. And then from that point, that's when you would go to start writing. Right. What what he said. Okay. And I just want to make it clear that we're talking about unit tests here, okay? Because there are different types of tests. So we're talking about unit testing in particular. Great. So I think w one thing I think is left out of this is the difference between the WordPress community and a test TDD community like Rails. So when you build Rails apps, that is how it's done, where every single app you build is built with some <laughs> testing suite. You have different gems, but it's always it's always built that way. WooCommerce is made to be extended. If we made it more complex by having more functions that are easily unit tested, it'd be harder to contribute to WooCommerce, it'd be harder to build off of it. I think, I don't necessarily think in this community everything should be TDD. I think that's a different, I think that's a different community. I think we're not, we're not there yet. And we may grow there, but I don't, I don't think we're there yet. So, so I think I think the problem though is that what you have is you have these large plugins, you know, that are on millions of sites, and one <coughs> update breaks millions of sites. Yep. And so that's, that's the problem. That's the problem. That <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? That's never happened. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so I think that that's the problem is that there's, um, you know, there's this reputation you know, for WordPress plugins being the wild, wild west, you know, not being written well, you don't know whether it's gonna break your site or not, and so, you know, I think there's, you know, there really should be an encouragement towards making sure that your code is as stable as possible. Now, of course, you won't be able to, you know, unit tests will not catch everything, but it will catch many things, all right, and that's what you want. You want to know that you've put, especially if you're building a product, you wanna know that you've put something out there that is as stable as possible. If something pops up that you didn't foresee, okay, just fix it. You know, but you want to be confident in what you're putting out there. Pig okay. Piggyback off that real quick. I went to a, a local uh, produced event called Web Afternoon yesterday, and um, Jeffrey Zeldman's partner, uh, Greg Hoy, was giving a presentation, and he started out by talking about craft brewers and beer, and then he made an analogy to uh, web development and so forth. But during his presentation for craft brewing and beer, 
he talked about one particular person who uh, runs his own brewery, but he also runs classes about how to be a great brewer. And when asked why he does that and empowers his competitor, he says, I'm in the business of craft brewing, um, and we're competing with the, the giants. I don't want anybody to say craft brewing, craft beer is bad. So I want to make sure that everybody else who is brewing craft beer has kick-ass beer. Oh, so that I'm piggybacking off of what I think you were saying, which is you're you're putting plugins out there. You want people to, to trust your plugins. So you really need everybody else who's doing plugins to have plugins that can be trusted as well. And there's a guy that yeah, did. one more question. Taking instead of a, a TDD approach, one of the we talk about classes. Uh, my mindset is more like a responsibility-driven programming as opposed to uh, test-driven programming. But even within responsibility programming, you can craft unit tests on, okay, this class or this set of functions is responsible for this set of functionality and nothing else, and craft your unit tests around that point. And so that way you, to address your, kind of a, a hybrid approach to address your, do we get it out or not? Well, we have to, we have to, get this out. We have a responsibility to get this out. We have a responsibility to the community. We have a responsibility to our clients. We have a responsibility to our users. So let's build the unit tests to make sure that we've met our responsibility. All right, are there any non-test driven development questions? <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so then I think we've just got a couple minutes. I just wanted to, um, I, I like to use this uh, a lot when I, when I talk to people, um, you know, on projects. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and all things, all wants and needs in life were, were met and taken care of, and you, you didn't have to be anywhere tomorrow or do anything ever for the rest of your life. You could just do whatever you want. The magic wand is totally wave. But... You have to make one more awesome plugin. What would that be? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I like um, I love helping people get something set up. So I'm going to go with like some sort of coaching plugin, like a Clarity FM or something like that. I like I like talking to people and helping people fix their problems. <coughs> It, it, WordPress sure, as long as it's WordPress okay. related, Thank yes, you. sure. Okay, so the one thing that I would do is I would make it so that every component in WordPress is, um, is optional. And that you mm. as a developer, you have a choice of what component you want to turn on. I do not like the fact that, you know, when you go, let's say you do not want to have a user screen or on the user screen you want to turn some things off there are not the hooks there for you to be able to do that so I think WordPress should be made so that each component is something that you can choose whether to add or not for your particular case for your client so that's what I would love. Mike would you like to wrap us up? A feature plugin called Object Relationships and, and what would that be? Somebody can Google uh, for a post or a, a, a track ticket I put up about four years yes. ago. <laughs> um, it would be a plugin that would allow you to create relationships between any two posts or a post and a user, a post and a, a post. So any one that sort of actually um, has all the. the the use cases w worked out and do doesn't have like blind spots. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead, sir. Um, just, just as an, an encouragement, I would say I am sitting up here today because of this guy right here next to me. I will say that he taught me everything that I know. That he encouraged me. Um, he always told me, "Hey, you're smart enough. You can do this. You can figure it out." He's the one who taught me PHP Storm and getting a debugger, you know, he didn't let me just kind of sit back and, you know, not think that I could do it. So I would encourage you, you know, find somebody, find somebody that you, that you admire, that you, um, 
you know, that you can look to, that can mentor you. It may not even be, we don't have an official mentoring relationship. You know, I'll ping him sometimes or he'll ping me sometimes, but you know, that's about it. Um, but find somebody that you can look to, even if it's just through their GitHub profile, even if it's just through their blog, find somebody that you can follow behind, that you can look to, that you can be encouraged by, so that you can, you can keep going and so that you can do whatever. Again, as I said, I would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for him. So. Look what I brought. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got uh, a really, really long stream on Twitter. Message oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> On that it's, note, it's reciprocal. It's, I go back to her a bunch. I'm going to try to wrap us up here. I just wanted to say thanks to these guys. If you could just give them a quick round of applause. <laughs> and if you have any more questions, they're all on Twitter, so that's got to be it, right? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Thanks. And lady. <laughs>